So hello, everyone. Welcome to our Governance Made webinar titled today, How to Work Practically with AI in the Boardroom. My name's Sean McDonald, and I'll be your somewhat moderator for the next 45 minutes. Uh, thanks a lot for attending today. We really appreciate the effort you've made to be here. And during our session, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen as against the chat. We'll be answering these during our sessions and try to get through as many of these as we have time for. We are expecting a lot of questions, so um, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, finally, um, if you stay through till the end of the webinar, which I hope you will, and is customary for our webinars, we've got a special treat for you. By answering a one-minute survey at the end of the webinar, you'll go into our draw to win a beautiful gift hamper worth over $500. Now, for those that uh, know a little or don't know a lot about BoardPro, we are a board software provider that serve about 20,000 users around 20 countries of the world. And we enable organizations to prepare for and run their board meetings more effectively and efficiently with, yes, you guessed it, clever software, with less time and deliver more impact and value for your organization. And as much as we are a board software provider or a board portal, as some people call us, part of our wider mission is to make the fundamentals of governance free and easy uh, to implement for all organizations, especially those with resource constraints. Now, the resources section on our website has hundreds of business templates, guides, white papers, all of which you can, which can be accessed and downloaded for free. Uh, against the resource section on our website. So let me introduce our panel for today's webinar. Julian Moore is well known across Australasia for helping associations and other nonprofits boost their revenue through high value partnerships and sponsorship programs. As an unabashed technology geek, he has a deep understanding of the AI world, boy does he what, and how associations can use AI to improve their operational performance and make a greater impact on the sectors they represent. Having worked extensively in Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, Julian has a knack for making the complex topics easy to grasp. He loves to showcase practical ideas through stories and examples that people can relate to. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. How are you doing? Excellent. Stephen Bowman is the Managing Director of Conscious Governance and is a regular on our webinar series and brings a great depth of experience with board reviews and strategic planning. Steve has a wealth of executive and governance experience and has written over 14 books on governance and strategy. Good day to you, Stephen. And hello, everyone. Welcome. Okay, so for the next 40 odd minutes, just relax, listen, um, add to the discussion by um, asking your many questions. A full recording of this webinar will be sent to you 24 hours after the webinar today, and it'll also be hosted on our website, which you'll find under our resources section. So let me now hand over to Julian to get us started. I'll bring up the first slide, and away we go, Julian. So as you can see, uh, I decided not to use any slides today. So Sean contacted me. Uh, prompted by Stephen to talk about AI. Now, AI is always spoken about because of a range of reasons, but mainly because of its content ability, its ability to produce things. So today, what we're going to do is a live walkthrough of the AI and AI tools, giving you an overview of what's currently in use today, right now. So what people are actually using, not the future truths or anything around there, but right now, what can you do with AI from a laptop in a hotel room? So uh, I want this so that you have a really good understanding of what AI could be used in your organizations, the practicalities of it, and then how to implement that into your strategic sort of plans and so forth. On the strategy side of thing, I'm very lucky because I've got Stephen with me to help me guide me through that. So rather than give you death by PowerPoint, let me give you some life through AI. And, and with you, that, should be able, <clears throat> you should be able um, to share there, Julian. Yeah, I'm just going to get that across. 
and move you. And my job in all of this is to bring it back to, so what does the board need to know about this? What are the implications for board discussions? What do we need to help our board get their head around? Those sorts of things. So it's going to be a a fabulous uh, discourse that we're having over the next 40 minutes or so. And boy, is there some things you're going to need to work through. So here we are on Google. The first thing, of course, is I'm asked to present to you on AI. So, of course, most people are saying, well, where's the presentation? But realistically, why would you create a slideshow? Why would you create the information without using the actual AI itself? Because... Again, it's content. So this one's called Tome. Tome is, it's free to use. You can go up in scale. It's about 20 bucks for the per month for the full flight thing. And when you click create on here, what it does is it then asks you what you want to create. So I want to create a presentation, not an image or handouts to go along with it, but I want to create a presentation. And it asks me then how many pages would you like? So I know Steve wants only two page documents. If it's a board paper, I want two pages, <laughs> please, Julian. <laughs> so I'm gonna go AI in the boardroom. Now you're about to see also some outstandingly bad typing today. So congratulations, AI in the boardroom, uh, hit enter. And that's it, that's your presentation created. It then goes away takes all the concepts from its knowledge bank. In this case, it's GPT-4. Um, and then it says, okay, so you want to know how artificial intelligence is revolutionizing corporate decision-making. So it says, are these the titles? So just for pure speed today, I'm gonna to say yes, continue that. It will then create that presentation for us. Once it's created the slides, it will then actually allocate artwork. So, and this is all royalty free artwork. And this artwork again means that you can use this in any place, anytime. And there's our presentation on AI in the boardroom. So, the rise of AI in the boardroom is it essential? And as you go through, you can see it's no longer just a buzzword. Keep in mind the reason AI happened is in November. So in November last year, uh, GPT 3.5 came out. Now, as we know that, that's a large language model that allows it to have some very clever predictive text. So 17 and a half billion uh, websites visited, understood, distilled. It understands the patterns in language. They discovered a new piece of programming called um, Transformer. And then once the transformer was put into it, we got uh, AI. Still think of it as predictive text. So as we go through, you then have a look through, why is it essential? Now, remember, we've given it a bias here. We've given it a, I want you to talk about this. I'm, I haven't said positively or negatively, it's gone straight for the positive. So this data can be used to make more informed decisions leading to increased efficiency and profitability. Okay, now, so let's 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 explore this a bit, can we, Julian? One of the big issues that boards have got is to understand the implications at the top level of, um, you know, things like accuracy, privacy, um, hallucination, bias. You know, and back in uh, when when we first ran this, probably six months ago, they were essentially buzzwords that people had just started to think about. What's happened in the last six months, from your point of view, about how? how this has developed exponentially that actually provides some comfort at the board level that these issues are actually being addressed globally. Yeah, by all means. So uh, if we say the last six months, uh, we'll be here for two years to cover everything. Let's say the last six weeks. That okay. will be because to give you an understanding, November, we got our first AI. Last week, we had 3,000 new AI tools. So it's, it's ramping up exponentially. They're using one AI to create many. Now, in the world of bias, bias is actually getting trained out of it. it, it bias, used, they identified it as an issue and they're kind of systematically training it to be bias neutral. And GPT-4 at the moment is the most bias neutral. 
when so with that's not really a current concern for it anymore funny enough the biggest concern in bias right now uh is actually it's biased in the way of um gender rather than anything else so if you ask it to show you a doctor it's invariably a male and if you ask it to show you a nurse it's invariably a female but this is actually patterning it's showing you the most likelihood in society so it thinks it's still correct so it that level of bias is one they're still challenged with um and on privacy it really has been resolved um essentially now we have a gpt enterprise an enterprise is the one that you can actually use within larger organizations to meet all the privacy so no data is left it's sso compliant it's all the compliance um i get asked i see on the uh, questions there what is gpt for gpt and gpt4 are simply a text-based um content creator we'll see it shortly so the issue that many boards were starting to grapple with in terms of how do we make sure that if our, if our staff are using uh, artificial intelligence, how do we make sure that it's not uh, exponentializing bias that we don't even know about? How do we ensure that our uh, intellectual IP is protected? What we're seeing now is that is that the various uh, providers of AI have actually taken all that into account as starting to work with it, correct? Yeah, absolutely. You've nailed it. It's essentially you find the large language models, the GPT, are very much on the ball for this because there's only really three of them. You've got Amazon, uh, Google, and OpenAI, and they're the three big ones, and they're all fighting against each other to um, be the best. Um, Meta has come into it for the Facebook one, but it's not very good. A great question is, uh, can uh, the enterprise level, which is and what that means is if you... Uh, if you um, purchase or use uh, artificial intelligence that is built specifically for your organization can that be used for in-house policy and procedures uh, is it uh, is it self-contained yes it is 100 percent self-contained no data ever leaves your system it's fully compliant with the banking legal and medical sectors and government so- Many people on this call will have heard of enterprise risk management, which means risk right across the organisation. What's happened right now as we speak is it's now available. Enterprise artificial intelligence is now available. Same same sort of thinking as enterprise risk management right across the entity, but it's owned by the entity and nothing leaks out. Exactly. And you're also able to fine tune that to your own organisation so that it understands your data and acts upon it. So. Right. We'll see, an ex- uh, as you see, the future of the boardroom. Remember, this is uh, a very fast. We haven't adapted any of this. But essentially, AI systems with the ability to analyze data are already with us. So the, if I can just say the implications, and, and I really want people to get this, the implications is if you did a briefing paper to your board two months ago about AI, it's totally out of date today. Oh, my word. So, uh, so, so looking at the implications for the board, you know, I did a white paper about four months ago and I'm looking at that and it's, it, yeah, the stuff's still relevant, but it's out of date because it's moved just so quickly. It is. Um, it, keeping up with this, you can imagine uh, if we said that we didn't have AI um, in October last year, we have got it in November this year. And right now we have things where, Um, it's changed the face of deployment. So if we have a look here, I I cannot, I promise you, I cannot program. I don't even know half the words for the programming. But what we have here is a great example of the increase in productivity that say maybe your events department, your marketing department, your corporate, whatever department decides that they want a website for whatever purpose if you just want it for the board if you just want it for your events whoever wants one it's always been cost prohibitive and awkward previously whereas now there's websites that like this one this is durable and durable bases their entire so what type of business are we building um we can choose from a list so we will just choose a bakery because well 
I'm in Melbourne, as you can see, and I've only just had breakfast, so I'm slightly hungry. Well, the name of our bakery can be Hot Stuff. And clearly my 80s tragic Donna Summer is coming out of me here. So it's now gone away. It's taken our information. It's choosing the coloring. It's choosing the backgrounds. It's choosing the imagery. It's choosing the content. It's writing all the, the content about the website. And then what it does is add the services because it knows the services that the majority of bakeries has. It can do this for membership. It can do it for any industry, any niche organization, any niche department. It has the world's knowledge at its fingertips. So it makes its best guess. And once it's done its best guess, the website is made. That's how long it takes to make a website, everybody. Taste the freshness and indulge your <laughs> range of bakery goods made with love and passion. And as we go through about us, we're Hot Stuff's a renowned bakery uh, in Melbourne. Our services are custom cake designs, a personal favorite of mine. And then as Sophie's written us a nice uh, testimonial there, and we can see this is my location and a contact page. And any one of these can be customized. Any one can be regenerated. This is what I mean when I talk about advancements in productivity. What used to take a week takes now 30 seconds. But where else is that possible? What else is uh, do we have the ability to do? So uh, just briefly, uh, it's already expanded across to mobile. So this is an app maker. If we go to iPhone apps, we can now say, well, to match my website, I'm literally going to click get started. And then I'm going to choose the name of my app, add the features, drag and drop them in. And then I'm going to customize it with my own text. So I'm going to drop PDFs in, point it to websites. And then it takes and crunches all the details. I make it look pretty with some drag and drop. And then once it's done, I click publish. Now, that's it. So an iPhone app these days is at least oh, an hour and a half's work. And the pricing is about $60 a month instead of ten to $20,000 of what it used to be. So again, it's that increase in productivity. This is called Appy Pie for those interested. So let's go somewhere and have a look at something a bit more advanced, something that is changing the face of sales. So if your organization has members or customers, you want to contact them. This is Air, Air AI. And it's there's a lot of companies using voice recognition. There's a lot of companies using voice to text and text to voice. This is solely a sales and customer service rep. So it takes it from text an image or video and puts it into voice. And Tesla and Apple have now removed most of, if not all of their outbound call services because this AI will know who they're calling from your database. It'll know what they're calling about from your instruction. And then it'll have a 10 to 40 minute long phone call with them and the people won't know that it's an AI. So let's see if we can just get this to give us a quick demo. Hey, James. No, I'm not interested, man. Yeah, no worries. I hate calls out of the blue too. But I'm actually from Apple, and I saw you were checking out Vision Pro, and we're about to pre-order, but left the page. Man, I, don't, I, don't I was curious, what had you looking into potential? Okay, I can respect that. Can I just ask one question before you go? And I'll stop that there. I don't know if everyone could hear that, but I do hope yeah, at the heard. end you heard it go, can I just ask you one question before you go? And it crested down and it's got intonation and rise and crests and falls. It is indistinguishable in the States currently from a human. And in uh, we're always asked about, well, where is it in Australia? It's a little laggy. It needs just that latency turned up a piece so that it's a bit more natural. However, it can do this in any language with any accent and it can call anywhere in the world. Now, this means that it has the ability to call all your members or all your clients, but we keep thinking about it in human form. It can call them all at the same time. 
it can call them all at the same time. So if I want to call 5,000 or 500,000 people, I can do it now, this second. And in 10 minutes, I've called them all and I've got all the data and I've got all the responses and then I can map all the, if we've got voting rights or sales or whatever it may be, the data collection is amazing. And if they don't answer, I'll call them back at a later time. So this means the interactive nature is huge. And I'm always so asked, but... The, the, the implications um, are just getting larger and larger for boards in all of this. Not that the board, not that directors need to know how the, all these things work. They don't even know, they don't even need to know that they all exist. What they do need to know is that the fundamental business models that we're all, um, uh, that we've created as part of our business are now able to be leveraged in a way that the board is going to have to take a leadership role on. So, for example, there was a, a an article that came out a couple of days ago from Harvard Business Review that said, look, we need to have a bifocal lens on artificial intelligence. We've got the, the top lens of our bifocals is the, the big picture stuff, the privacy, the bias, the hallucination, the IP, who owns that, what are the processes we've got in place, the ethical issues, all that high level stuff in there. But the bottom lens of your bifocal is all about the work that we do. So if you and your organisation deal with words or images or numbers or sounds, and what they call WINS, W-I-N-S, words, images, numbers or sounds, then AI is going to have a fundamental impact on it. The board's role in this is to make sure that we're not left behind and that we actually start to do some research and we start to put some resources into identifying how we can get our staff to best use this in a way that is ethical, you know, appropriate for our sector, all that sort of thing. But it won't happen until the board actually says, we, this is one of these big things like cybersecurity. We can't wait for 10 years to figure out what it is. We've got to start developing play playgrounds for this. We've got to start giving guidance to our staff. You know, for example, one of the things that I'd really recommend that, that, uh, that you raise with your boards is having a look at your strategic plan, having a look at the actions in your strategic plan and adding a section into each one of those action plans that says investigate artificial intelligence and its impact on efficiency and effectiveness in this area for every single action in the strategic plan because it's out there already and what we know today is going to be out of date in two weeks time so we may as well get ourselves ready for it by developing up a, a task force or giving some sort of guidance to the staff that we can't just let this stuff slip by we've actually got to get on top of it and understand what it could mean for us I do love you. Raise, I, I really love you raised that because I'm always asked the most common thing I'm asked is it's going to take everyone's jobs. It's not. AI is not taking your job. Someone using AI will take your job. If you're not using it, then they're just going to be that much more productive. So with that in mind, let's have a look at the couple of uh, productivity bonuses. The, the one, so we've gone audio, we've seen some text or content creation. I want to show a very quick uh, video creator. The reason I've chose Hey Jen, Hey Jen is in my mind, the finest one. It's the one that allows us to, this is the CEO of Hey Jen, and that's an AI. So I write a script or I have chat GPT write the script. I then paste it in and he will talk it. So in this case, there's a huge amount of use cases for this. We can have uh, training and onboarding. You can have personalized sales, marketing, explainer how-tos. You can have a whole, uh, if you want to give information to members or customers from the board, you can have them do this. This type of thing means that we can now communicate across the world because one of the features are we can change outfits and the look of the person talking we can scan you in so just using a camera like this it will scan my face copy my voice i'll appear there and then you can type a text and use that but what most people do is choose from an avatar and when we say avatars we actually just mean body shapes and colors. So it essentially you choose from the avatar 
that you would like to use. And you can choose from, obviously, I love that they say real human voice. I'm not sure what a non-human voice is. So these, like they have hundreds, if not thousands of different avatars you can choose from every country in the world. And then you can choose what language they talk. So essentially you can create a script, drop it in, choose who want, you want to talk it, and then press publish. Next, you'd create with the same script in a different language and a different avatar publish. So you can communicate right across every language and every accent in the world sits right there. No one needs to present. You just give them the text to do the presentation. These are how engaging it's going to become. This is how it can create just the, the most magnificent thing. So when you look at YouTube, of the top 100 YouTube uh, creators at the moment, four of them are already AI generated. So it's not a human, it, they're, they're interacting with an AI generated individual. So we're seeing millions and millions and millions of people interacting with AI already on YouTube. But imagine if you want to advocate or lobby government and well, if you're advocating on behalf of someone or a group at, or you're wanting to lobby and you want to get traction, well, now I can create 1,500 videos around a single topic from a single point of view in every language, get them through every social media, onto every video thing, onto Facebook, and I can flood the market. I simply don't have to rely on traditional media anymore. I've got a bigger reach simply by using this productivity tool. Now, once that's happened, of course, your inbox fills up. And if your inbox fills up, then what do you do? Because if you're anything like me, this next part after video, after generation and everything, this is my favorite one. It's called Mail Butler. And it's a butler for your mail. And it, it integrates with Outlook. So it, it, uh, it absolutely abides by all of Microsoft Outlook's uh, privacy guidelines. It integrates with Google, so it abides by all theirs, which are obviously a lot more slack than the uh, Office 365 you have on your thing. But then what it does, it has some pretty standard features. It can track the email, see if they've forwarded it, what they've done with it. It obviously has your email signatures, and these are all pretty much of a muchness. But what it can do is this. It has a smart assistant, and the smart assistant is the most delightful tool. It sits in your email box. You switch on the smart assistant when you get back and you see that you've got a hundred emails and it will immediately go a smart respond. So shall we have a meeting to discuss on Thursday? Reply positively, reply negatively. It will just quickly do that. So you can whip through and you know the client or the, the uh, staff member that then sends you you know, chapter and verse, 20 pages to let you know what really should be a one sentence email. It has a smart summarize. You can just summarize the uh, email, understand it and respond to it. So these sorts of things are really cool, but the smart improve, if you're writing a very important email and you've typed it through, but you would like it made better, you just lit, click improve and it will improve the text, improve the content, and make you sound a lot more intelligent than maybe some of us are, especially me. So with yeah. this type of thing, the task finders are very cool. What my favorite one is, is when I'm away, it will actually answer some of my emails for me. So it will know how I've responded to these people before. And if it's just being copied in, it will literally just say thanks. Or and again, if we if we bring Julie, if we bring this back to, so what does this mean from the from a governance perspective, from a board perspective? Um, what it's what it's making clearer now is that today we've got a million different AI tools. Tomorrow it'll be a million one hundred thousand. The next week it'll be two million. The issue here, the governance issue for me, is that 
the, the, it, it's actually going to start to create the space where you have the haves and the have-nots, essentially. Those who have decided to look at AI and they've taken a very good hard look at what that might mean within the organisation. They've set up a task force to look at the policies, the procedures, the ethical implications. So they've actually taken a proactive stance doing that and the board can should be leading that. Um, but m most importantly, the integration into existing services. So right now, um, one of the things that the board should be looking at is working with the senior executives to resource some sort of task force or some sort of you know sandbox group. Um, one other organisation called it a, their cross-functional team. And literally they're reviewing right through the organisation every part of the organisation that uses uh, words, images, numbers and sounds to see how they could utilise artificial intelligence to make things quicker and easier within the guidelines that have been set by the board. Um, it's not going to happen without that sort of top level um, uh, fiduciary ownership of, of, uh, of this whole process. So what are your thoughts, Julian? Where do you see that going? Uh, I, I have to agree. Look, I, I honestly think right now, we're at the starting line. It was created in November. It's being constantly updated all the way through. And we're all at the starting line together. Um, my favorite quote from the creators of ChatGPT, which is OpenAI, um, was when he was being interviewed, Sam Altman, the CEO, they asked, uh, why don't you turn it off? We're quite scared of this. And he said, if I turn that off today, it would take two and a half years to still fully understand all the ramifications of what it can do. Now, that to me was quite scary because <laughs> that to me meant, holy moly, we know it's good. We don't know how good just yet. And let me give you a, this is chat GPT. Um, one of the great examples of the fact that it's built by techies and not by people who are understanding strategy are uh, that, if you pay for this, you get chat GPT-4, but for some reason they call it chat GPT plus on the background, nothing like making it confusing straight away. But here, this is the standard, this is the free one. Uh, um, let's say I want to ask- Julian, I'm, ju yes. I'm just just a suggestion. I think we could we could spend a lot of time showing how these things work and what. Let's, I'd, ra I'd rather, look at maybe some of the questions that are coming through and maybe explore the implications because you know, we could spend all day literally going through the new stuff and then do it all again tomorrow with the totally new stuff that's okay. been created. Yeah, Let me cover some of these questions off. So um, how's copyright dealt with? Are the images of people and their voice truly artificially generated is one. Do you want to have a quick go at that? Yep. So on the voice for Hey Jen, you actually sign a disclaimer away. And so all copyright is, is, so if it's yours, you can create a pro avatar, which you and you alone own. So no one can use that. If you create a light one, you sign your rights away and someone else can use it. So only so the answer to that is it's all been covered. You just need to be clear about what it is that you're asking for. One of the other questions is uh, we're assuming that we're all large organisations. We're just a small non-profit. This is actually more important for non-profits, <laughs> particularly those for, the, for those that don't have staff. <laughs> yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, in Australia, so a, go yeah, on. I, I was going to say as a small non-profit, this gives you an entire team. We can create membership uh, promotions, renewals, uh, engagements. We can create board papers uh, uh, with a input. We can organize the events. We can run the program. We can create all these things in absolutely moments. So you'll be more, much more effective as a small... So if you're a small organisation, and let's go down to the small end where, where you actually have no staff, so you've got a management board, and the reason they call that is because you're both a board but someone's got to do the work as well, you can actually set up a task force that says, um, made up of yourself and maybe some of your members or even some people who are interested, saying what are the top three AI tools that will enable us to uh, you know, engage with volunteers in a much more effective way. And you start playing with that. It's, it's, it's such low cost. 
So you get access to a team of people that aren't actually people, but enabling you to do the stuff you need to. You just need to put a bit of intellect, a bit of ethics, a bit of uh, um, guide, guidance in all this, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't start using this. The smaller, the more effective it's going to be, in my view. Um, one of the other questions is, uh, Pat's asked, what do we mean by hallucination? Um, very often it was said, particularly in the last six months, that AI comes up with a whole lot of stuff that's just not true. <laughs> that's hallucinating. So yeah, give me three references on X, Y, and Z. They'll come up with three references, but it's made it up as opposed to them actually being real references. How are they dealing with that now, Julian? Uh, well, the famous one is the US uh, law firm. Uh, law firm who went out and they went oh we got ai so give me i'm representing this organ this person who did a very bad thing um tell me how to manage that it wrote the papers they went into the courtroom and quoted it chapter and verse and they found out that it gave them made up uh case studies and made up resolutions so they look like complete idiots so uh, hallucinations are basically made up. It's just making stuff up. Now, that was something in the early days. Right now, they've got those down to such a tiny, minuscule amount that I've still never seen one, and I've really tried to make it do one. Um, so with that in mind, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but I would, give, say, urge caution. Whatever you create before you present it in any format, just check its references. You can ask it, give me the references for the content and just click and check it's correct. Yeah. That's Stace, a lot. Stacey's asked, uh, this probably gets my uh, my big tick for the best question so far. Stacey's asked, wouldn't the board's core focus on AI be around the risk and governance in relation to AI, i.e. if you are in the health sector having staff putting things into chat GPT, could be exposing the organisation to breach of privacy laws if information isn't identified. De identified. Absolutely spot on, Stacey. The, the board's role in this, particularly around the policy compliance reporting stuff, is actually pretty clear. First of all, develop up a, a board-endorsed framework for responsible use of AI. There's, there's all sorts of examples out there now. But the first thing is to get the board to sign up to a framework of how we're going to actually approach AI. Then you allocate the senior executive responsibility for uh, monitoring uh, how that's going. And then looking at um, compliance mechanisms for AI, rules of engagement. And again, the policy should do that. You have a board level artificial intelligence policy. They're all available out there now. All you've got to do is search for them. Make them your own, but don't wait for someone to do something bad before you write the policy. Get ahead of the curve. Start to look at developing the policies now. At the very least, it'll help start getting the board thinking. The other thing that's happening is we're starting to see boards now have under either emerging risk issues, uh, they've got AI, or emerging strategic issues, which is emerging AI. They should be standard agenda items now so that we can get our head around all of this. But the policy and compliance stuff is absolutely the board purview. Um, but also looking at its impact on strategy and risk so that we should be looking at, you know, if we've got our strategic plan, here are our three or four key strategies, here are our three or four key action plans underneath each one of those, and there's usually a resource section. Under that resource section, it should say investigate AI alternatives to assist. And That's then it starts becoming part of the way we do business. Yeah, it, you need to integrate every consideration regularly. Because right now, there is so much development going on. Uh, last week, we had uh, the head of Microsoft say that he wants every school-age child taught to read by AI. Because they found that if I take a one-on-one -on -one tutor and I take a AI to a school child, the AI teaches them to read in under 50% of the time. So they learn faster because it adapts the content to the way they're learning. It adapts to the way they want to learn. So neurodivergency is now moving away because it is completely adapted to the way they want to learn. So what does this mean for education? It's an enhancement. It's not doing away with anything. It's enhancing it and changing it. And every board should be aware 
that what happened to taxis when Uber came through could happen to them and be aware of this and be ready for any disruption that AI is going to bring to your sector. Julian, we have a number of uh, questions here. How much longer have you got? I can see you're wanting to uh, show Lucia. Ah, well, uh, I mean, I've got Lusha here, but realistically, Lusha is, if I want to find someone, it, it's a great tool to show the power of big data and AI. And I'm happy to answer questions while we're going along. Um, but Lusha is effectively big data. You get everyone from Facebook and LinkedIn and all the others, and we all love LinkedIn, but hate Facebook. But realistically, it's essentially just big data. And this is where it all ends up. So I can now find anyone anywhere in the world at any time. It used to be a case of if I want to find someone from, I don't know, I'm going to just choose Australia just to make it quick so we can get all the questions answered. And I can choose now any company in Australia. So well, it, it's too easy to say Amazon or Apple. So let's choose the Victoria Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It's literally Vecchi, a small association in Melbourne. And there we are. We've got the 150 contacts of the people who work there. And, uh, you know, the one I'm looking for is even the board members or the executive. So here we are. We've got the executive, the chief exec. There he is. I'm sure he would love me showing everyone his mobile phone number but here we are we now have his email address and his mobile number so finding people has just changed ai has changed the game it knows the internet it knows the whole internet so if your details are somewhere hidden on that internet we've got it so when it comes to privacy it's been taken into a whole new level because if your name your position your email anywhere on the internet now people can find it so and this really this raises the issue that I think the whole notion of ethical ethics and ethical behaviour needs to be an ongoing conversation both around the senior exec table and then with their departments, but certainly at the board level as well too, because it raises issues that we really haven't had to deal with so much in the in the, in the past. But certainly going forward, you know, how does this fit in with uh, you know with with the European? Uh, uh, privacy rules? How does it deal with the New Zealand, with the, the various countries that we're dealing with? We just need to be on top of that. So uh, at the moment, it complies with everything New Zealand's doing, everything Europe's doing, um, but they are actively lobbying every government not to impose anything new. Uh, don't underestimate just how fast these people are getting around the world and engaging with governments. Um, okay. I we might say... have to finish up there, Julian. Yeah. Any, any last words for... Um, I would say on this, embrace AI, just like the internet when everyone said, I'm not going to use email and now we all do, AI is the same. Don't be afraid of it. Just learn how to use it, embrace it, because if you don't, someone else will and they'll be more productive. Get it on your board agenda and get them to start resourcing both the people and the, and the actual time spent in looking at this. And you'll find that has huge impacts in the next 12 months. All righty. So um, feel free to reach out to uh, Stephen and Julian if the uh, LinkedIn details are here in front of you on the screen. I'm sure they'll look forward to your connection. Let me go back. Uh, let me go back a slide. Excuse me. We have a wealth of webinars coming up over the next uh, four to five weeks. The next one is from Stephen, actually how to continually refresh your annual board strategy. That'll be a really good one. And a popular one that we are running from last year is creating your CEO report that will delight your board. All of this information, all of our schedule uh, for our masterclass classes and our webinars are on our resource page on our website. So just as you're leaving, don't forget to complete our one minute survey to enter our draw for that $500 gift box. Now, if you then comment on our webinar post on LinkedIn and follow the Board Pro page, you'll double your chances to win the gift box. So just search for Board Pro after the webinar and you'll find us and be able to put a post or a comment against that. So uh, thanks again for everybody attending today. Really appreciate your support. Thanks, Julian and Stephen, for your conversation. 
Hope you enjoyed our session, everyone. Have a great day.